Freezing Inferno, Soviet Union versus Finland 1939-1940. This is a two-player war game, which can also be played solitaire, two-handed, and that is how I played it, controlling both sides at the best of my possibilities. The game is not out yet, uh, should be on Kickstarter in the near future, so what you're going to send this video is a prototype. The publisher asked me if I wanted to take a look and make a video for it, and yes, I was curious about the game, I was curious about some of the pictures I saw online, so I agreed to do so. So one, what you see here is the prototype, not the final version. Two, in case people are still making paid previews of Kickstarter games, I want to clarify, this is not one. Uh, this is not a paid preview, I simply play the game and I tell you what I think about it. So it is a review of a game that has not uh, been released yet. The map of the game looks pretty neat, it is a mounted board, it is a large map, my hand here is for scale. And it just looks very nice, because uh, it almost looks like a fantasy map at first sight, just because of the level of detail of the illustrations that you have here. But again, it also looks uh, legit, and is very playable as a war game map. One thing, I hope, it's, it's big enough, but I hope that the final version will be even bigger, so that there is more room in the hexes around the units so that it's easier to see the terrain that the unit is in. And I mean, I can see that there is something underneath, but sometimes I have to check if that's a city or a forest. No big deal, really. The general situation, it is the Soviet invasion of Finland. The Soviets will be coming from that area and they will be moving in with a lot of might, a lot of power at the beginning, a lot of air support, artillery support. Hopefully their attack will slow down later in the game and I'll tell you how uh, the, the, the Finland player may have a chance of doing so. The point is control of these cities that you see on the map. Cities have a number that doesn't represent uh, victory points, it represents military resources that the city generates. So every other turn the players will count how many resource points they control and they can use them to refit units and to bring new units on the board. Some cities also have stars on them, those are the key cities, and in order to win, the Soviet player needs to control two of them plus a number of other cities on the map. So control of the territory is all that the game is about, and so, you know, the Finnish player has to try to delay the Russian advance for as long as possible. Setup, if you're playing the game two players as it is mainly designed to be you have a secret setup each player takes a copy of the map or a paper map of the map a paper paper, a paper map of the board you know what i mean right <laughs> and marks on it where they want to set up and then they reveal and they set up accordingly I play solo, which means, guess what, I set up one side and then I set up the other side. That's it, kind of ignoring what the other side had. I think there can be some pretty interesting surprises there. One side had committed to attack strongly in one position rather than another, but I didn't feel that I missed much by, by um, setting up that way. The game will last eight turns, and the turn tracker is uh, basically this deck of cards, number one, two, three, four, all the way to eight. For each card, like number one, number two, you have three copies or three variants, you have three cards, number one, three cards, number two, you shuffle and you select a random one, a random two, a random three, etc, etc, etc. So the, this deck both represents the turn tracker and also the event deck. So you're gonna have a lot of historical flavor here and an effect uh, that will uh, be in effect for that turn, so giving more vari variety to things. Military units are represented by these nice uh, thick uh, counters here that tell you the, the combat value of the unit, the defense value of the unit, the movement points of the unit, and, uh, and of course, the illustration tells you if that is infantry 
or that is armor, for example, and then we also have two kinds of air units. We have the fighters and we have the bombers that also can airlift land units. We have artillery and we have we have artillery and we have anti-air guns and we have leaders. Now as you can see I'm holding some of these units in stacks because there is this interesting very interesting very cool idea here which is the numbers that you see on the top uh, on the on the units themselves represent again the combat values but then the number of units that you have in the stack represent the strength so right now for example this stack of tanks has this, the basic combat value of each unit is five the strength of the unit is also five because there are five units there and the total attack value is the strength of the kind of is is the value of the kind of unit plus the strength. So right now this unit of tanks has a total strength of 5. Printed 5 plus number of tokens in it. If it takes hits, right now this unit has a total attack value of 8. 5 plus 3. And I think that there seems to be like a kind of like a miniature wargaming influence here. I can totally see like a tray with 5 tanks and you remove one and that of course influences things. And so that's, uh, that's an interesting idea there. As I said, we have air units and air units always have to start from airports and so those would be legal placements. The, what you see here is the range that they have when they execute combat missions. For example, this one has a range of 17 hexes. The bombers also have another range which is for airlift as opposed to the fighters. They only have the range for for their combat thing and again and then we have Finnish forces that work exactly the same with with air units uh, going in airports and again the idea is that you're gonna have stacks because the printed value give you the basic value for the unit and then the number of tokens in a stack is what gives you the, uh, the whatchamacallit, <laughs> this what gives you the strength Leaders, very important because units to be in supply and to be able to activate fully need to be within a range of seven hexes from a leader. Which again, it's kind of easy at the beginning, but then especially as the Soviet player, uh, your forces are likely to start getting a little bit stretched. And that's a problem, of course. Now, after you resolve uh, the event for the turn as determined by this card, or you take into account the lasting events, then uh, players will... And, and also, also there are possible other optional phases depending on whether you're using some optional expansions or not, such as, as things adding diplomacy or espionage, for example. But then you start the main turn in which the Soviet player goes first, understandably, they are the attacker, and they will activate any and all of their units one at a time in any order. And so probably you will want to use your artilleries and your air units to attack. And then uh, maybe you move in with your land units. It's usually a good idea because when you're attacking from air to ground, there are no negative consequences for the air units attacking the ground. And of course, ground versus ground is not quite as lenient. A couple of other things may happen if a air unit is is moving in the range of another air unit, then the other air unit may intercept. And so you have air to air. If an air unit moves within the range of an entire aircraft gun, then you also roll a die and you see if the air unit takes damage. And so basically, different from other games in which you spend, you move everybody and then you attack with everybody and then the other side does. You move a unit, you resolve their action entirely, and the, com including combat, and then you attack, you activate another unit, move it, resolve their combat, then another unit, move in combat, and so on and so forth. So combat is always between one unit on one side and one unit of the other side. 
Uh, big restriction, of course, for air units. They need to start and end movement uh, in airports. And they have to be uh, friendly airports. So that, again, at the beginning, well, you're the Soviet, and so you're going to have easy air support. But then, and, and that can be really powerful. But then you need to use your ground units to take control of enemy airports. So then you can relocate your air forces and from there launch more air missions and provide your land units with support as they move closer to the key cities that they need to take control of in order to win. Um, and again, suppose I resolve a couple of air missions, now I move in with this unit here. When units are on the ground and when they move adjacent to enemy units, they are influenced by zone of control, there are classic zones of control, so to speak, projected by combat unit in the six axis surrounding them and you have to stop when you enter the zone of control of an enemy unit. And combat is uh, is pretty simple. Uh, simply, you will look at this double-sided uh, play array depending on whether you're resolving ground to ground or air to air and you use this one basically when on when both combatants are on the same level or there's uh, the table here for air to ground combat. Something important also if when you're attacking Basically, combat is considered to be taking place in the location of the of the target. So, uh, you will simply calculate the ratio between the total strength of the attacker and the total strength of the defender. Again, that is a combination of printed values and a number of units in the stack. Once you had the ratio, it may look pretty scary, like, oh my gosh, we have to calculate 121%, 140%. Well, once I have like 7 to 6, or 7 to 5, or 8 to 5, I simply look for the corresponding column there. It literally says 8 to 5. So in truth, once you have the numbers, you just compare them in your head. Oh, that stack is 8, and that other stack is uh, is 7, for example, then I simply look for it, and one stack is 8, and one stack is 7. In truth, you don't even have to do the math. You just look at the column that has the numbers. And then you roll a die, and you apply modifiers, so usually based on terrain. Now, the die is an 8-sided die, which is a little bit unusual. Not only that, but if you think there's too much randomness in 6, in eight results that are equally likely. The game even comes with customized twin-sided dice that are twin, have twin-sided, but they only show numbers between one and eight, and they show them in distributions that will favor median results. Once you have your column, your modified die roll, you cross-reference, and then you simply apply the result. In most cases, only one side will take damage. Say here, only the defender takes damage, losing two uh, counters in the stack. Here, only the attacker takes damage, um, losing a number of units in their stack. If the uh, attacker loses, then they have to retreat into the hex they came from, if they, it is the defender, then well, they have to retreat. Other results are possible, such as optional retreat instead of mandatory. The, the player that receives that result doesn't get to activate uh, in their following phase, in which they should, and they get that token to mark that. Uh, possible counterattack from the defender that may try to attack immediately. So the kind of results are possible. But at the end of the day, it is a game in which one side moves a unit, attacks with it, resolves that combat, then moves another unit, attacks with it, optionally, and continue like that. Again, with a little more complexity with the interaction between air units attacking ground, possibly being intercepted by air units, and or being attacked by anti-aircraft, but the general idea is actually very, very simple. And again, you need your leaders to be projecting uh, their leadership within seven axes, otherwise units will suffer penalties. So again, that's the idea. Continue to play until the end of turn eight, and at that point, uh, if the Soviet player has made enough on advance and conquered enough uh, enough towns, then they win the game. Otherwise, the Finnish player wins the game.
This game is good. This game is very fun as base as judge from the prototype. Production values look also pretty good if the final production of course keeps those thick counters. I don't see any reason why the art would be less pleasant than it is now. I cannot say anything about the rulebook because I didn't have one so they sent me a Word document. Uh, the one thing that they're gonna need is a player aid with the terrain effect. Uh, the prototype doesn't have one, but again, I'm pretty sure that they'll figure that out. That's pretty standard stuff. When it comes to gameplay itself, the situation is pretty interesting because you have a very strong dichotomy before attacker and defender. When you see that uh, it's all about uh, uh, taking those, those cities, then you know that the Soviet player is going to be on the offensive the whole time and the Finnish player will have to slow them down as much as possible. And it's a situation that does create a lot of tension because there are times on like turn 4 where it looks like there aren't many Finnish units on the board anymore. The Finnish are just like hanging there by a thread. But maybe there's a group of desperate defenders that are protecting an airport preventing air support, uh, uh, Russian air support from coming in. If they lose the airport, then those can relocate there and then the air support can like destroy everybody. So slowing down the advance of the opponent, slowing down their taking control of the airports can be vital. And uh, you're around that time, like half halfway through the game and after the first couple of turns, you thought I should be winning by now as the Soviet player, but you're not yet. Oh, I should be winning by now, but you're not yet. Look at this. This entire area of the board is completely uh, cleared of Finnish units. I can explode that direction and, and spread out. But there's another part of the front that maybe completely collapse. And then you, the Soviet player, don't have anybody there anymore. And then the Finnish player can try to push in that direction. So, you're going to... You're gonna see a beginning which is gonna be very intense and is gonna make the Soviet player feel very good and then things slow down. But what I like is not a, a crawl, just there's it's not a stalemate in which everybody just sitting there in front of the other, pushing my line, push back a little bit. It's gonna be a dynamic situation because the entire front is so thin and it looks like the entire front or multiple parts of the front are gonna collapse one way or the other one way or the other if you push a lot in one direction as the Soviet player you're likely to leave some other areas uncovered and again you really have to make all these different levels of coordinating air and the ground units work together so again the airports are particularly uh, powerful um, incentives to try to take or to retain so I was pretty surprised because by the end of turn two, I thought like, but this is a foregone conclusion. Why should I play six more turns when it's obvious that the Soviet player is going to make it? But again, unless you keep providing air support uh, with your units, then uh, those weak, those weak land units of the Finnish player supported by air can do a lot. And so you need to make sure that they don't have that advantage alone. Um, another thing about the combat system, which is a bit unusual because I expect that as a Finnish player I'm gonna move back and then they move in and so I have a strong line of defenders in a lot of other games that would give me a 3 to 1 or actually they would force the opponent to go against like a 1 to 3, 1 to 4 and then my counter attack is gonna be so powerful. Here is not exactly the same because combat is always between individual units so by having a nice line of defenders that doesn't weaken the attack of the attackers. Still gonna be, it can still be pretty powerful and, and, and dry and, and bleed one of my units dry pretty bad, but then that may be then the opponent is gonna be surrounded by his own control, cannot move anymore, uh, is subjected to more counterattacks. Um, you're not gonna have large movements probably in which you're gonna surround a large number of units. There's not gonna be large encirclements because there aren't enough units on the board to do so. But the fact that you destroyed an enemy unit but then there are a lot of other enemy units which individually uh, can attack you later then that could be... That's an interesting situation. It's a different flow from what I've seen before. And looking at that at that table and figuring out if something was gonna be like 171% to whatever scared me until I realized that 
in actual in actuality it, that those combat tables were very easy to read because the numbers I was looking for were actually written there on the top of each column. Terrain is important. Terrain, of course, you have to take that into account. Tanks in forest, not so good. And tanks are very powerful. But I like the fact that there are weaknesses that can be exploited around them. And this seems to be the general idea. You have units that work in very different ways, but there is there is really an interesting almost rock, paper, scissors. This is weak or strong against that one, which is weak or strong against that one. And so there are situational elements that you have to take into account which make again the flow of the game and the kind of decisions you make very interesting. So Freezing Inferno from what I've seen from this prototype this is a solid game with a lot of interesting decisions for both players. Again one side will play very different from the other one side is the desperate defender the other side is the mighty attacker who may run out of steam earlier than they expected. So there are interesting challenges and interesting decisions for both sides. I'm definitely pleased uh, with Freezing Inferno.